Hello everyone, welcome to Auto On Demand, where I post videos every week about pop culture, politics, and everything in between. So if there's one day I think I'll remember for the rest of my life, it's when Michelle Obama walked into that inauguration. And no, not this inauguration, because sis did not want to be there and dressed accordingly. Like it was giving, had to throw on something for your 8am lecture. Hair pinned back like she was at a funeral. And wasn't she in a way? <laughs> but no, 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 no. I mean this inauguration. Ladies and gentlemen, the 44th President of the United States, the Honorable Barack H. Obama and Mrs. Michelle Obama. I literally ascended. The memes, the fan cams, my For You page went insane. Like that. Scrolling through Insta, right? I saw this post. Which, period. But then I opened the comments. Too bad she's a dude. Maybe transgenders aren't so bad after all. I didn't know bad had Y'all rocking with Barack and Michael? Yo, she got a And I was gonna walk y'all through the incredibly shocking, musty and crusty accounts attached to these comments, but I was like, you know what? Let's not be petty today. I'm gonna write it off as charity in my tax returns. And that made me think about this post about Megan Thee Stallion, under which there were several more comments, again, calling her a man. And let's never forget some of y'all commenting on Serena Williams's body and gender, like someone was paying y'all to do it. So today we're gonna address this because like, it really seems like some of y'all be looking like this if you go more than two seconds without defeminizing a black woman. And frankly, it's getting weird. We're gonna track this phenomenon all the way back Back to the American slave trade. We're then gonna analyze media tropes and stereotypes that have kind of made it easier for this phenomenon to come about. And then we're gonna look at some modern day examples. We obviously have a lot to cover. So go ahead and sit back, relax, subscribe, and let's get into it. But first I have a Patreon now. Thank y'all so much for your suggestions on my last video. And like, I'm so excited to bring y'all like more bonus content and behind the scenes and, and anything y'all want really. Right now on my Patreon, you can watch a behind the scenes video of exactly what went into making this video from like researching, script writing, filming, <laughs> like I really cover it all. And also an example of the podcast episodes I'm going to be putting out on my Patreon, which are essentially just podcast episodes of these videos, but on like more spicy, less like YouTube friendly content. Every single penny I make from both YouTube and my Patreon are going towards paying the scary and massive amounts of law school loans I'm about to take on um, once school starts this fall. So even if you don't go to the Patreon, y'all don't skip the ads, please. The link to the Patreon is gonna be in the description box below. And also I'll put it in like a pinned comment in the comment section. So yeah, without further ado, let's officially get into it. Okay, so first I think it's really important to pin down like why exactly these people think these black women are men. Like there has to be a reason, right? Is it like their height? Because Taylor Swift is about the same height as both Michelle and Meg and I don't hear anyone calling her a man. Or is it like their build or like skin color or skin tone? And to find out, I took to the streets. I went undercover. Detective Otto. I mean, I also just, yeah, it was basically just asking questions on Twitter. Let's start with Megan. This person says, so Megan the Stallion won a Grammy and Nikki doesn't have one yet? Congrats, Marcus the Mule, I guess. And I replied, wait, why are you calling her Marcus? Like, LOL, do you think she's a man? Like, why? Just to kind of foster, like, I just wanted to seem non-threatening to kind of foster a conversation, like, you know? Another tweet read, the day Megan the Stallion gets pregnant and gives birth is the day I'll believe that's a woman. Until then, good looks, Marcus. To which I replied, wait, I'm confused, LOL. Like, why do you think she's a man? I asked other people about Megan as well and no one replied. So I went to YouTube instead and found this song released in 2019 called Mega Man and the singer attempts to explain why they think Megan is a man so let's give it a listen I think Megan a man Megan Megan a guy don't be fooled by her lyrics she might twerk some with the hotties but she got a football with hey, the body hey. big big of course but a style is an uncastrated male horse Ribbit. wide neck it look just like a law tree say it's camel toe but what if it was bald right. they say i'm hating but i'm just speaking honestly True. i think that megan the man standing up when she peed okay 
Okay, so we're hearing a good amount about her build and some confusion over her name, Stallion. Okay. As annoyed as I am that this beat isn't trash, like the beat underlying the song is not that bad. The lyrics are trash. In the comment section, there are even more people saying they'll only believe she's a woman if she gives birth, demanding to see her birth certificate, and saying that her real name is actually Joshua Pete. And now let's move on to Michelle. One Twitter user posted, I recently went to Target and saw Michael, quote unquote, Michelle. Obama's new book and flipped it backwards and upside down, which <laughs> I mean, take that lip charts or like whatever they say. So I replied saying, wait, genuine question. Why do you think Michelle is a man? And they replied, there's videos of Obama calling her Michael. Distinguished guests, Michael and I also want to acknowledge uh, your son, Jack. Michael and I, Michael and I. Also videos of Michelle dancing on Ellen where she thrusts her hips and shows the print of a member. Are you not ashamed of yourself? Are you not embarrassed? This is really embarrassing. So that video again focuses a lot on her build and her body and why it's not feminine. And again, a lot of calls for her to prove her gender somehow. So now I'm gonna go on something that sounds like a tangent, but trust me, it's related. Sojourner Truth was born into slavery um, in New York State and gained her freedom in 1827 and um, spent her time going around the US giving lectures on the abolition of slavery. She was six feet tall. She had these like muscular arms that she'd gained from the strenuous and forced labor that she'd had to do her whole life. And she was independent and outspoken. And in October, 1858, she was moving around Indiana, giving a series of lectures. And while she was moving around, rumors started circulating that she was a man posing as a woman. At her final lecture in Indiana, a man stood up and interrupted her lecture and voiced his doubts on whether she was was actually a woman. When giving his reasons, he cited her body, her outspokenness, the way she talked. Like he was just saying there's no way that those features could exist in a woman. And the challenge was put to a vote and the overwhelmingly male pro-slavery crowd voted aye. The men then suggested that she prove her gender by exposing her bosom to a small group of women in the crowd. Miss Truth said, I'll do you one better. And she exposed her bosom to the entire crowd. And um, later the Boston Liberator reported she did so so not to her shame, but to their shame. And isn't it truly a damn shame that it's 2021 and black women are still being asked to prove their femininity and prove their gender to the masses? Why? Like it somehow manages to touch on intense transphobia, sexism and racism all at the same time. Not only insinuating that there would be this like groundbreaking horrible issue with a biological man choosing to present as a woman, but also this belief that it makes a woman less feminine to be tall or strong or assertive or God forbid have like muscles. And somehow I predominantly see this mostly happening or most publicly happening to prominent black women. And Lord knows this is nothing new. Let's take a little trip down memory lane. So to properly analyze the masculinization of black women in America, we're gonna need to take it back to the 18th century. Back then, the dynamic between cisgender white men and cisgender white women were pretty firmly established along a masculine and feminine binary. And when it came to the white women, true femininity looked like being a good wife, being a good mother, and exhibiting traits like innocence, weakness, frailty, and a purity to the point of almost like sexual prudishness. This also went hand in hand with the fact that upper class white women who were kind of held up as like the picture of femininity rarely did any manual labor. And in fact, like left most of the housework to the enslaved people. And this feminine role complemented the white masculine role super well. This dynamic was completely not the case for black men and black women simply because of the institution of slavery. The line between masculinity and femininity was was much more blurred for black men and black women back then, with both black men and black women being seen as like strong workhorses with long staminas and a capacity for manual labor, which by that era's definition were all masculine traits or masculine qualities, automatically disqualifying them from the societal conception of femininity at that time. This status quo, along with like various media tropes and stereotypes that I'm gonna get 
into next made it super easy and socially acceptable to masculinize black women and strip them of their femininity. So now let's kind of dive deeper into the specific tropes and stereotypes that have been imposed on black women. In US television, I think the three most predominant stereotypes that have been imposed on black women are the Mammy, the Jezebel, and the Sapphire. The Mammy was this like kind of cheerfully subservient and maternal figure all too content spending most of her time fulfilling the wishes and tending to the wants of her white family. Now, here are the papers for you to sign. But if I sign them, then what? Then you'll have a 20% interest in the Aunt Delilah Corporation. You'll be rich. You'll have your own car, your own house. My own house? You gonna send me away, Miss B? I can't live with you? Well, don't you want your own house? No. How am I going to take care of you and Miss Jessie if I ain't here? Let me and Piola stay the same as we've been doing. I's your cook and I want to stay your cook. This trope is named after Mammy, a character in Gone with the Wind. And her very first appearance in the novel is described as a huge old woman with the small shrewd eyes of an elephant. She was shining black, pure African, devoted to her last drop of blood to the O'Haras. That obviously isn't like the most flattering description. Like I really dare someone to compare me to an elephant in my lifetime. But like that's kind of the thing with mammies. Like they are often described or perceived as unattractive to the characters around them. She's so, so far from being an object of desire for seemingly anybody. And in fact, doesn't seem to have any desires of her own outside of fulfilling the wishes of her white family. Examples would be the role played by Hattie McDaniel in Gone with the Wind and also Aunt Jemima with her little kerchief and her big smile like just being a smiling slave on the pancake box. This stereotype invalidated the femininity of black women by kind of painting them as these like sexless beings that could never be the object of love or desire for anyone and whose only purpose was to kind of uplift or prop up the other characters in their lives or in the movie. Then we have the Jezebel stereotype, which essentially kind of served to prop up black enslaved women as these like evil, immoral temptresses that would essentially use their weird sexual wiles to lure in um, white male slave owners. The whole point of the black Jezebel was essentially just to paint black enslaved women as the opposite of the white femininity that prevailed at the time. Like the black Jezebel wasn't chaste, she wasn't pure, she lacked self-respect, she lacked self-control, she didn't have any of the good feminine characteristics that would be present in a true woman at that time. So unlike the Mammy who was like practically asexual, the Jezebel is, is too promiscuous, like she's too manipulative. Though the like Jezebel stereotype was applied to all black women, you know, during slavery and throughout the 1950s, it was interestingly concentrated on mixed race or light-skinned black women. A great example of this is Lydia Brown in Birth of a Nation. She's portrayed as promiscuous and like manipulative, using her wiles to kind of control these unassuming white men. Other examples would be the 1973 film Black Hooker and the 1989 film Harlem Nights. And lastly, we have the sapphire stereotype. This stereotype portrays black women as kind of bossy, aggressive, sassy, and lacking the femininity and like softer qualities that would make her a legitimate love interest. And of course, she's usually brown or dark skinned. Stinky! Hey, you cheated! Baby, I would never cheat on you. Now come here. I'm gonna show you what kissing is all about. <clears throat> oh, oh, oh! He's just playing. He knows he likes me. Stinky, come here! This is definitely the most prevalent, most popular, and the most, I, I would say, common stereotype that's imposed on black women. It usually manifests in, you know, like the, the angry black women, the loud black women. These qualities obviously contradict the more tame, quiet, and submissive um, nature that the traditional idea of like femininity um, is supposed to include, and paints the black woman as like uncivilized and uncouth compared to the more quiet, tame white woman. Some great examples would be Pam from the 90s show Martin and Aunt Esther from Sanford and Son. Now these stereotypes aren't 
great, right? Like they don't really ascribe like widely accepted like positive traits to black women. Now the trope of the strong black women was kind of recently created to kind of paint black women as strong, like nearing indestructible, assertive, independent, self-sufficient. But this unfortunately feeds into like not only just the masculinization of black women because for some reason still <laughs> strength and assertiveness and independence are still like widely attributed to masculinity or men but also the adultification of black women which is just as much of an issue and this has real world consequences for example a national 2017 study by the georgetown law center on poverty and inequality found that adults believe black girls ages 5 to 19 need less nurturing protection support and comfort than white girls of the same age and that black girls are more independent and know more about like physical relations than white girls. Studies have shown that viewing black women as strong or like stronger than women of other races has led to serious mental health and coping problems within the black community and within black women, disparities in how severely black girls are punished at school, as well as disparities in medical treatment as well because the idea that black people or specifically black women don't experience pain as acutely as others do is still very prevalent in the medical community and though like the studies and statistics are there like no one had to tell me this i am a five foot nine darker skinned black woman i have lived in fear of developing muscles at the gym or like wearing my hair short or making sure that my voice wasn't like too deep or too masculine i grew up seeing women like cara delvine and kristen stewart experimenting with like little chic tomboy styles cutting their hair short wearing like more like tomboyish clothing and never having their femininity questioned once. And I also grew up hearing Michelle Obama be referred to as a quote, ape in heels and seeing Serena and Venus Williams being referred to as like manly men on the regular. So I was like, I clearly do not fit this job description. <laughs> and it really does seem like apart from height or build, like any deviation from this very rigid standard of femininity seems to like entitle you to abuse apparently. Whether it's your weight, race, voice, Lord knows trans women and specifically trans women of color are subjected to violence and death solely because of their assumed gender. I believe that everyone should be able to embrace their femininity and also like define it in ways that make sense to them and make them comfortable. But it's so unfortunate that these like continuing and traditional like rigid ideas of what femininity should look, talk, and act like are so aggressively pushed on black women like Megan and Michelle to the point that they are put in a position to prove their femininity to the world. It's just like so, so disheartening to have to see these black women like being asked again and again and again to prove that they're like feminine enough to occupy these spaces, especially for people that look like them or share characteristics with them. Let me know what y'all think down below. Like, have you had any like personal experiences that kind of mirrored the ones that I brought up in this video? Like, I'd love to hear it. Again, don't forget to check out my Patreon for a behind the scenes video of this video. And yeah, I'll see y'all next time. Bye.